The energy from the solution to the Schrodinger equation for the hydrogen atom is negative e squared over 8 pi epsilon naught a naught times n squared where n is restricted to being a positive integer due to conditions imposed by the solution to the differential equation. The Bohr radius, which is denoted as a naught, is epsilon naught h squared over pi mu e squared. From this solution, there is also a limit imposed on the values of l, where zero is less than l, which is less than n minus one. This should look familiar as this is the relationship between the n quantum number and the l quantum number that is commonly known. The relationship between these two quantum numbers are imposed by the solution to the Schrodinger equation for the hydrogen atom. Also recall that the energy for the hydrogen atom that Bohr calculated more than a decade before the Schrodinger equation existed was negative mu e raised to the power of 4 divided by 8 epsilon naught squared h squared n squared again where n is equal to a positive integer. This is exactly the same as the value found above from the Schrodinger equation. This is a remarkable result given that the Bohr model of the hydrogen atom is semi-classical and that quantization had to be imposed. For the Schrodinger equation solution, however, quantization is a natural result. Also, the Schrodinger equation solution explains how atoms bond as well as the order in the elements as illustrated by the periodic table. Therefore, it is a much more powerful model and why it supersedes the Bohr model. Let's now set up the Schrodinger equation for other elements. Using the helium atom as an example, which has two electrons, the Schrodinger equation takes the form of negative h-bar squared over 2 capital M times the Laplacian minus h-bar squared over 2 times the mass of the electron times the Laplacian minus h-bar squared over 2 times mass of the electron times the Laplacian and that's all operating on psi. To that we add the potential energy term where we have first the potential energy between the nucleus and one of the electrons and so we have negative 2 e squared over 4 pi epsilon naught times the distance between the nucleus and the first electron minus 2 e squared over 4 pi epsilon naught times the radius of or the distance between the nucleus and the second electron and to that we're going to add e squared over 4 pi epsilon naught and the distance between the two electrons. And that again operates on psi, and it's all equal to e times psi. In the first part of this equation, we have three kinetic energy terms, one for the nucleus and one for each electron. In the potential energy part of the equation, there are also three terms. There is an electron-electron interaction term as well as two electron-nucleus terms, one for each electron. The mass of the nucleus is much larger than that of an electron. We can also assume that the nucleus will move much slower than the electrons. Given these assumptions, we can say that the nucleus is fixed and we're going to let it be the origin. We can then simplify the Schrodinger equation for helium to be negative h-bar squared over 2me times the Laplacian for electron 1 plus the, ele the Laplacian for electron 2, and that's operated on the wave function psi. From that, we will subtract 2 times e squared over 4 pi epsilon naught times 1 over the distance between the electron 1 and the nucleus plus the distance between the electron 2 and the nucleus. And that again is operating on psi. To that we will add e squared over 4 pi epsilon naught times the distance between the two electrons and that is multiplied by psi and again that's equal to e times psi. This equation cannot be solved exactly, where we can come up with an analytical solution like what we have been able to do so far in this course for all other systems that we have examined. The inability to solve this exactly is due to the electron-electron interaction term highlighted in blue. Solutions to the Schrodinger equation can, however, be found through numerical means. These types of methods is what allow programs like Gaussian to approximate atomic properties, such as the vibrational spectrum of a molecule. We can still use hydrogen-like solutions to the Schrodinger equation to describe the orbitals of other elements when they only contain one electron, as this eliminates the problematic electron-electron term. These hydrogen-like solutions are scaled by z, the atomic number, which acknowledges that as the element gets heavier, the charge of its nucleus gets bigger. The two shown here will be replaced with a z on the next slide so that the solutions are generalized for all atoms. Here is a list of the solutions for hydrogen-like atoms up to n is equal to 2. 
Recall that these solutions are formed by multiplying the radial part, as was solved in this lecture, with the angular part, which was solved in the rotational spectroscopy lecture. Now let's look a little more closely at what the constants that were defined when solving the Schrodinger equation represent. n is the principal quantum number. It defines the energy of the system and determines the row on the periodic table each element is placed in. L is the total angular momentum quantum number. It determines the angular momentum of the electron around the proton as given by h bar times the square root of L times L plus 1. It is limited by n, where L ranges between 0 and n minus 1. So if n is equal to 1, then L can only equal 0. m is the magnetic quantum number. It determines the z component of the angular momentum. It ranges between minus L and plus L. It makes sense that the z component is limited by the quantum number that defines the total angular momentum, since any component of a vector cannot be bigger than the vector itself. Put it another way, the sides of a right-angled triangle cannot be bigger than its hypotenuse. We haven't talked about the fourth quantum number, intrinsic spin, yet. That will come in the next lecture.